So welcome. We're going to be talking today about antibody cocktails for treating the coronavirus. It's a very interesting topic. I've uh, referred to it a couple of times where basically some of the companies, Regeneron is one of the big ones, where they go back to patients that have had the virus. And this is not getting uh, serum from the, these individuals. This is getting cells from the individuals, uh, stem, stem cells, T cells, uh, B cells, immune cells that are then um, cultured and cloned. And then um, these uh, incubators for developing antibody are generated. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. And one of the big questions is, is this a big breakthrough? Is this a potential, quote, cure? You know, I don't want to be accused of being overly clickbaity about, about this. But the question is, how much of an opportunity is this for us? Uh, as I've said many times, you know, a lot of people say, you know what, this is not going to change. We're not going to have a, a vaccine. Uh, why worry about it? Let's just go ahead and, and get out there. And uh, if you're going to be the one, if you've got, a virus has your name on it, then go ahead and deal with it. And I've said, you know, Janice and I both have agreed, we want to give humans more time to work on things like this. And this is one of the areas where I do have some significant hope. Uh, upcoming topics, we'll be talking about masks uh, a little bit later. We don't have that in here, but again, I'll just give you the verbal uh, update on it. Uh, a couple of things, one is masks, and I believe that's gonna be Wednesday. Can masks actually, uh, impact this virus and spread. The other one is brain. And what is the, uh, what does the coronavirus do in terms of your brain? I, I'm not gonna go through all the topics we've covered. We've got, gosh, 30 or 40. Uh, many of them are set in that long hour, an hour and 15 minute uh, YouTube live Q and A format. Uh, Carl has taken some of those, especially some of the more popular ones off sectioning them out and making them available in a uh, shorter format. And uh, those have been doing well. In fact, uh, one of the mo more recent ones had to do with that uh, new, more contagious uh, mutant. And what, what is it, D D613G or something like that, that the guys at Los Alamos found uh, that took over in New York and many other places. Um, <clears throat> These, these two weeks are more of a transition back away from that uh, everyday format to our usual once a week. So uh, we'll have one today, Wednesday and Friday, and then starting next week, we're back to uh, once a week. And as you saw from last week with uh, Doug Thompson, we're starting to get back into some of the general cardiovascular prevention uh, topics that we cover in this channel. Uh, other updates, I'm not going to spend much time on these. We've covered them before. There's, again, a lot of activities going on in terms of antibody testing. Uh, one of the big trends with antibody testing, you've got some of these, quote, immediate or quick tests available. Uh, both Abbott um, and Roche have some. The Abbott one came out of the blocks. It's a, got a lot of reach. There's a lot of urgent care set up with the kit. Uh, and the, um, the equipment used for that test. But as you might imagine, came out of the blocks looking really good, started getting a lot of use, and then a lot of frustration, a lot of errors. Um, 
the Roche test is quote coming out 100% accurate end quote. I haven't seen any of the more recent uh, uh, information post deployment, but here's the bottom line. There is no great uh, antibody test solution right now. There's continued work going on in terms of profiles looking at uh, IgA, IgM, IgG, and profiles looking at actual titer amounts. Titer means how much antibody do you have? And that's not new. We've done that in the past for things like syphilis and some other infectious diseases. Uh, a low titer obviously means one thing, and a high titer or high concentration of antibody can mean something entirely different. So um, just some quick information about uh, other things that we have to offer. Webinars, obviously, Michelle's been doing a lot of great work in terms of um, getting our webinars um, out and available. With the webinars have been very well received. It's a, it's a way to continue to see your own doc in your own hometown, uh, assuming you're able to actually see the doc these days, um, but not break care with your primary care doc, but still be able to get, uh, get some care and fill in some of the gaps. Primary care docs throughout the country have been documented. Less than a third of them know exactly what they need to be doing to diagnose and treat prediabetes, for example, the real pandemic that's killing and disabling more of us than COVID. So uh, what are some options? Again, uh, take a look at our webinar and you'll find out there are some options. We're gonna be changing the CIMT webinar uh, title to plaque webinar and focusing mostly on CIMT and adding a calcium score to that. Again, the whole idea is to help steer people away from the current poor practice of just saying, hey doc, um, do I, can we tell if I'm gonna have a heart attack? Why don't we get a stress test? Uh, there are better ways to, to approach that. And that's what this webinar is about. Have, uh, we often, we'll, constantly get questions about, Doc, can you give us a little more detail about supplements? Supplements are very, very important. I used to think back in, oh gosh, decades ago that supplements, I was one of those guys that thought supplements were basically just expensive urine. And then I really started to focus on the science about supplements. And they're a lot more than expensive urine. It's, a, it's, um, it's really clear. Supplements are, you can't supplement your way out of a bad lifestyle, but you can't medicate your way out of a bad lifestyle either. And you can't stint your way out of a bad lifestyle and you can't bypass your way out of a bad lifestyle. But there are places for each of these things that we're talking about. With the amount of supplements that are out there, what's, it, it has exploded in terms of the size of that market over the past decade but so has the misinformation. And our focus is uh, providing uh, science, reliable information. And when the, when the science is unclear, telling you the science is unclear in this space, um, but focusing on prevention, again, focusing on cardiovascular disease uh, and prediabetes. So we did a lot of work on that today and uh, Michelle's moving ahead on getting that ready. Uh, we do have a subscription plan. We've had a couple of folks already say, you know what, that sounds good. I'd really like to get up and rolling. Um, I'll be going on Medicare in a couple of years. And I know that Medicare has some challenges in terms of what they offer for prevention. So, Doc, can you tell me a little bit more? Um, and here you go. So uh, take a look at that if you have an interest on the book. We actually had somebody start a professional in the uh, in the uh, field of books suggests that we may want to talk to a big house, a big publishing house on this. We'll keep you posted on that. That, as usual, is a continuum. Just writing the book is a continuous saga in and of itself. So let's get back to the program. Um, again, are the, uh, are the antibody cocktails a big opportunity? Are they a breakthrough for COVID-19? Carl? Um, Doc, before I do the water ball, can you check the cam? Um, it's out of focus. Oh, okay. Thank you very much.
So I tell you what, I'm going to have to switch to another camera. We'll use this one for today. Okay, that's that looks better. Okay, thank you, Carl. We had some camera problems uh, when we were recording this past weekend, and don't want to go down that bunny hole. But let's go back to today's topic: antibody cocktails for treating the coronavirus. This uh, mostly most of this information is coming from an article. Scientists are working on antibody cocktails to treat the coronavirus. Um, <clears throat> antibody cocktails is one of the latest experimental therapies. It's thought to provide temporary immunity for at least a couple of months and treat those who are infected and experiencing symptoms, basically giving them time to develop their own inherent, more long-lasting antibodies. Antibody cocktails have been around since the 1980s. They've been made for viruses like HIV and, and Ebola, certain cancers, lupus, and multiple sclerosis. Um, the pharmaceutical company Regeneron is currently leading the fight against SARS-CoV-2. Um, it, uh, it expects to have an antibody cocktail widely available sometime after June. And we'll, we've got a video that, um, where there's an interview of the, uh, the, the CEO for Re Regeneron talking about this. New York's Mount Sinai Health System also has teamed up with the drug maker Sorrento to create, create a cocktail that could protect someone for up to two months. Now, antibody cocktails are not the same as plasma transfusions. You know, tra plasma transfusions started, what, over, was it over 100 years ago? Uh, back uh, with transfusion of uh, plasma for people with um, with strep uh, infections due to, to uh, streptococcus. And uh, researchers first identified the antibodies in people's plasma that works best against a specific virus, and we'll talk about that in just a second. The there's a lot of antibodies, but you got to find the ones that work. Then they synthetically produce copies of them in a lab. Now, synthetic is also a little bit of a misnomer because, again, as I said, it's a uh, it's a biological product. When you're using convalescent plasma, you're basically giving all the antibodies that someone has. But when you're using an antibody cocktail, you're basically using two or three specific antibodies that are very specific for this virus. So it's a much more targeted therapy, said uh, Dr. David Rosenthal, the medical director at Northwell, Northwell Health's Center for Young Adult, Adolescent, and Pediatric HIV. This can be, uh, excuse me, just a minute. This can be uh, helpful if a virus were to mutate. If the mutate, mutation renders one antibody useless, there will still be at least another antibody that can bind to another part of the virus. Even if a vaccine were to become available soon, not everyone will respond well to every vaccine. Antibody cocktails should give those people another option. Now here's some challenges. Uh, through preliminary, uh, the preliminary data state shows antibody cocktails work well in some cases. Other antibody cocktails haven't worked well at all. Um, for example, the one with HIV. We'll talk about that in a minute. Antibody cocktails can still be challenging to make uh, to make for viruses that mutate. Now, every every virus mutates sooner or later. Um, but the question is at what rate and how significant is the mutation? Uh, despite our coverage of that uh, Los Alamos mutation, I, I'm, not sh I'm not seeing a, hu a huge amount of evidence. It's, for example, it's nowhere near the uh, programmed mutation rate that you see with seasonal influenza. For example, uh, scientists have struggled to design a reliable antibody cocktail for HIV. And again, it has not worked. Uh, HIV has uh, some significant inherent issues that make it much more difficult for treatment and vaccine and antibody cocktails. With SARS-CoV-2 behavior not yet fully known, there's no guarantee a cocktail will work. 
Also, like any treatment, there's always going to be risks, benefits, and alternatives. Antibodies can also backfire and make it easier for a virus to enter and infect cells. A lot of things uh, remaining to do. Researchers need to identify the types of antibodies that are neutralizing. And remember, not all of them do that along with uh, the part, which part of the coronavirus they bind to so that they can make a well-rounded cocktail. They also need to figure out how long the antibody cocktails can provide immunity for and how the virus, how that varies from person to person. That requires clinical trials. The exciting thing about using antibody cocktails is that they provide the potential to very specifically prevent transmission of COVID and possibly help people that are already infected said Rosenthal, but they're very early on in design. And we have a lot of work to do to understand if they really can make a clinical impact. You wanna hit the, uh, that video? So tonight, we continue to focus on the science of coronavirus. With no proven treatment or vaccine, the scientific community has turned to a promising near-term solution, use of antibody drugs. There are several companies that are developing this kind of approach. Regeneron is one of them. Joining us now is the biotech company's president and chief scientific officer, Dr. George Yankopoulos. Doctor, thank you so much for joining us. Explain how an antibody drug works. There are natural signals in the body that drive beneficial immune and inflammatory responses. Um, the problem is oftentimes these immune and inflammatory responses can become excessive and they can create more damage than good. And the hope is by using this antibody that specifically blocks this one inflammatory pathway, it can actually benefit the inflammation that's seen in lungs that's causing people to have the difficulties breathing and eventually succumbing uh, to this tragic disease. And Kevzara, which treats rheumatoid arthritis, how could it help with COVID-19? Some clever scientists in China decided to try it and they reported that yes, it looked like it might be benefiting the inflammation that you get in the lungs in this disease um, and patients might be getting better. Those studies were uncontrolled anecdotal studies, and we initiated a controlled study to see whether or not this really can make a difference for patients. Let's turn now to the other coronavirus program and drug that you are working on, this cocktail. How would that work? When you give a vaccine, you are given uh, something that is induces what is known as an immune response. Unfortunately, it takes time to perfect the way to get the body to do it itself. Uh, luckily, we and others have technologies that allow us to make these exact same antibodies outside of the body and then purify them and give them back to people. And it's as if these people have been vaccinated. When could this therapeutic drug be available? Well, the first potential treatment, we should be able to know as a scientific community within the next few weeks to a month or two, whether they are really working in a controlled fashion and what about the antibody cocktail that could be a pre-vaccine? By June, we could be testing it. And once again, within a month or two, we might know, uh, at least for certain patients, if it's safe and effective. So by the end of the summer, we could be treating hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. Well, Dr. George Ancopoulos, thank you very much. So thank you so much for your interest and your uh, attendance. Joe, good morning. And yes, thank you for making us aware of the focus problem. Good morning, John, James. Uh, yes, I think you'll see this in a few of the comments. Yes, I'd welcome discussion of other health topics beyond COVID-19. You're doing a great job on covering the virus development. And uh, I think you'll see, well, we'll cover, we'll, I'll make a comment in a minute. Um, I'm Jan H. I'm male, 5'10". I'm uh, 5'10 male as well, Jan. Um, John, it'll be great to get back to more normal topics. I'm really interested in the calcium uh, score test topic you mentioned. So very welcome news. Thank you, Dr. Brewer. I've got a series, John, on the calcium score. Um, and it's a major part of uh, the book that we're coming out with. The um, 
Calcium score is a great alternative to stress tests. CIMT is as well, and CT angiogram. So to me, uh, rather than just say, hey, doc, my, my cousin had a heart attack or my uncle had a heart attack, um, can we make sure that I'm not gonna have one and get a stress test? What I'd much rather uh, people begin to do is look at these other three options some combination of them, because all three of them have come out of the blocks with um, much better information, much more predictive information. As you can imagine, all three, CIMT, CT angiogram, and calcium score have their own problems. With CIMT, it's the fact that so few of them have been done. They require fastidious quality and rigid quality control pro uh, programs that most individual clinics just can't handle, and most uh, CIMT practitioners have not been able to handle. But in the right hands, they are a critical way of judging this. You know, the problem with a stress test is that a stress test is gonna be negative unless you have over 50% of the flow occluded. In other words, 50% of the flow is blocked. Here's the real problem. Two thirds of heart attacks occur when you don't have 50% occlusion. You have more than 50% flow. So by definition, that test is not well designed. Um, coronary artery calcium score is exactly what it says. It's, look, it's a, a, a CT technology. It's looking at calcium in the arteries of the, um, the heart that supply the heart muscle. Again, a basic design flaw is that it's only looking at calcium. So it's missing that whole component of the more dangerous soft plaque. Um, again, got a series on, on uh, calcium score, CT angiogram, and CIMT. And again, if you're interested, we've got the, uh, an upcoming uh, webinar on them. Because Guess what? Plaque is important, and yes, it is. It's killing and disabling more of us than COVID-19. I mean, it's like a Vietnam War, what? Every two weeks? Every two, every two weeks, depending on how you count the numbers. If you just talk about the US military deaths, it's a Vietnam War every two weeks. And I believe once you begin to include uh, the deaths in all with all armies and the civilian deaths. It's another Vietnam War about every two months. And we seem to be okay with that. We haven't, we haven't really had the impact on people in their lifestyles um, due to heart attack and stroke that we've had on something like COVID-19. Start, I'm starting to sound political. Don't want to go there. Um, Chuck K. Uh, hello, Chuck. I'm also happy to hear you'll be including coronary artery calcium score, CACS. How accurate is that test? I got a score of zero, but at 65, I'm having trouble accepting it. My wife is 12 years younger and her score was 40. Well, Chuck, you bring up a really, really good point. Um, as we said, uh, it's only looking at calcium and calcium in the arteries of the heart. Usually by the time most of us have had, had any significant experience with insulin resistance, and as you know, that's the majority of us over age 40, or at least by the time we get uh, 50 and 60, we've had this process going on long enough to form calcium. And sure enough, if you look at the calcium score uh, numbers for uh, men and women, they just, they go right up as we age. Men's calcium scores start earlier and they go up earlier. Um, I didn't know we were going to have that many questions about that. I would have, um, I would have gone in and, and, and shown a couple of uh, video or a couple of images on how men's calcium score goes up. But yes, we've seen people with a negative calcium score that had significant problems uh, with soft plaque. One of the more common things that I'll see is that somebody will come to me, they'll have a, 
positive uh, calcium score, but maybe not too bad. They'll, they'll, that calcium score will get them going and they'll lose 30 pounds. They'll uh, get started on the right uh, lifestyle components. They may even start some medications. They'll get a lot of things done and I will, and they'll want to go back and get a calcium score and I'll warn them, be careful about your expectations, because here's what's likely to happen. You're likely to have had <clears throat> significant soft plaque that didn't show up on the original calcium score that you got worried about. And if you're expecting to do a victory lap, think about what you're going to see. You're very likely to see a big increase in your calcium score, not a reversal. Now, reversals in calcium scores do happen but when I see people improve their lifestyle, improve their plaque situation as documented by CIMT, as documented by symptoms, as documented by uh, other components, more often I'll see an increase in calcium score because what they're doing is they're shrinking that soft plaque and it, some of it's calcifying. And again, you know, after I go through that a few times with uh, the typical patient that's gone through that experience, quite often it's not that much of a, of a big deal. Many people will say you can never reverse a calcium score. That's all, not like most um, uh, emphatic statements, that's not entirely true. We've got, a, we've got one documented. John, who used to do a lot of work with the channel, uh, actually reversed his calcium score by about 59%. Huge increase. I've never seen that much of an increase. Now, I've got another patient um, just this past um, month or two who's had a significant, it was like 10, 15% reversal of his calcium score. We just uh, recorded his video and um, we'll, we should be editing that and getting that, uh, that video ready to put out to, to uh, publish, but it's very uncommon to get a reversal of calcium score. Uh, I hope that those, it's not that uncommon to get a reversal of plaque. It's not common, but it's not as uncommon as getting a reversal of a calcium score. But again, these are both things that most, uh, most cardiologists, most other folks will say are impossible. They're not impossible. Um, there are significant problems with the calcium score. Most people would also say, even proponents of calcium score would also say, don't get one every year. It's say get one every five to 10 years. And again, that's the reason. Calcium is not going to budge. It's not gonna move nearly as quickly as soft plaque. Jim D, where do the cocktail antibodies come from? Are these from human donors, if from human donors, how pure and safe are they to use and how do they standardize them in efficacy? So uh, Jim, I don't know if you saw any of the introductory comments. I've made introductory comments on this specific uh, uh, title. Gosh, for about a month now, uh, Regeneron and some of the other companies with Regeneron again being one of the major um, uh, groups, they will get uh, serum and cells, living cells from individuals and then do what, what they can in terms of what's possible to sterilize them, grow, regrow those uh, cells and put them in a, uh, in a mechanism, incubate them so they can start growing antibodies. Then once they get a, uh, a mass of those antibodies in that liquid, then they take that liquid out and um, work again to purify just the proteins, the antibodies themselves. So it's actually a little bit safer than you might, might imagine. John Tocho, I had a calcium score test about seven years ago when I turned 60. It was zero then, but I know it is time to have it done again. I would have it done again at this point, John. Um, <clears throat> you're actually um, in the minority, if my memory's correct, I think you're in the minority even at 60 to have a zero calcium score. Um, I don't think it's as important to have a calcium score as it is to get a, an OGTT, oral glucose tolerance test, and an insulin uh, response, insulin survey. 
And I think those are important, but uh, doing at least a, a few quarters of um, uh, continuous glucose monitoring is critical as well. So there's a lot of things that are more important than your typical, let's get a Framingham and then let's get a stress test. These other things that we're talking about, I think are far more important in terms of understanding how much risk are you, um, are you at right now? Or wh what is your risk? And if you're age 67, you've got significant risk until and unless proven otherwise. And it's fairly easy. It's simple to prove otherwise. If, you ha if you're wondering about how to get one of those tests, the um, OGTT and IR tests, we have, you know, we've got a webinar set up for that. It's been very popular. You just go in and rifle shot, get the uh, OGTT with insulin response. And we also go ahead and get an inflammation panel uh, while we're drawing blood. Then we go over those numbers um, in a group. Dave Murphy, how often should you have a follow-up calcium score if you present with a high original score to verify your treatment protocols are working? Well, that was the, the exact story that I was talking about a few minutes ago, David. Calcium score is not at all good for follow-up. CIMT is far better for follow-up. So, uh, couple of advantages and disadvantages. Calcium score is available. It is, was easily standardized. Uh, you can get them uh, on the corner uh, x-rays are us. CIMT, on the other hand, is more difficult to find. It's, uh, as we mentioned, it's got a, some significant challenges in terms of uh, quality and repeatability. So you got to get it done in the right hands. But Disadvantage on calcium score is number one, it doesn't show soft plaque. And number two, it is very difficult to, to gauge improvement because it's so much less likely that you lose calcium. Some people do, but again, it's very, very, it's not common at all. Many people will greatly improve their situation. And not only will they not lose their calcium, as I mentioned before, they'll actually gain calcium because they're taking a lot of uh, a lot of soft plaque and turning it into hard plaque as they shrink it. Joe Riley, everyone, uh, thumbs up, please. Thank you very much, Joe. Thank you for the reminder. I know as a YouTube creator, I'm supposed to be doing that all the time. And I just forget. Right. Some things I, uh, well, some things I'm not so good at. Some, I'm good at a couple of things, but that's not one of them. Joe Riley, why does soft plaque not show up while hard is? Because soft plaque doesn't have calcium. Soft plaque is basically made up of oxidized LDL. That oxidized LDL got in there because either usually, uh, usually you, you had inflammation, cardiovascular inflammation, and usually that's due to high periods of high glucose and or, and even more likely sometimes, periods of high insulin. Uh, you can also get it from other types of inflammation such as rheumatoid arthritis, but um, those are the major causes for having LDL, oxidized LDL seep through the intima, the lining of your artery wall, and get stuck between the intima and the media. That's what happens. And that's what soft plaque is. It's just a whole bunch of that. It becomes really soft as the immune system sees it and sends in MPO, myeloperoxidase, and plaque 2. Uh, but these are both enzymes that are actual actors in the in cardiovascular inflammation excuse me, process. Once they do that, they soften the plaque. They turn it into a soupy consistency. So it's basically just oxidized LDL plus a bunch of these, um, the enzymes and some other things, biomarkers, cytokines. You know, most of you watching this channel uh, know and understand what, uh, how the immune system is, is, uh, hitting the artery walls with friendly fire to try to get that uh, plaque out of there. Once it does that, it turns that into a soup. That soup, that soft plaque does not have calcium. So 
um, if you're doing a calcium score, it doesn't show up on x-ray. You don't feel any different and it doesn't show up on x-ray. So there's no x-ray type of uh, x-ray or CT that's going to show soft plaque. I hope that, uh, hope that gets, uh, gets some clarity. Karsten Nielsen, pomegranates seemingly taken between meals seem to be able to decrease calcium deposits and calcium score. Do you have info or comments to this? Yes, I used to take a good bit of um, uh, pomegranate juice, but here's the problem with pomegranate juice. Um, one problem is that it's very, very high carb. It's got a ton of sugar. And for guys like me, most of us, as we get into insulin resistance, uh, that sugar is not the greatest thing. It just jacks our blood sugar up. So the next time you take some um, uh, pomegranate juice, Karsten, let us know what, take your blood sugar after that and tell us what happens. I have not found a lot of uh, low carb. I haven't found, I found some uh, pills uh, with uh, some pomegranate components in it that were low carb, but that was about it. Here's the other thing, Karsten. Um, yes, like we, we've said multiple times, supplements help, but they're not a, um, they're not a replacement for a lifestyle. If we need to lose 10 pounds, we need to lose 30 pounds. That body fat is what drives this inflammation uh, by creating some of those inflammatory um, enzymes. Um, and um, again, I, I used to drink pomegranate juice. I don't anymore. Uh, I drank it for the reasons you discussed and I stopped drinking it for the reasons I discussed. Jam we do have, we do have, by the way, Carlson, there's a lot of different supplements that do appear to be very helpful, ranging from vitamin D3 and K2 to cinnamon, uh, bergamot, uh, bergamot, uh, a form of bergamot and uh, berberine, several other things do appear to, to be able to be helpful in this space without being harmful. Um, again, we're going to, we'll cover that in our, um, in our supplements webinar. James Cantor, does CIMT view soft plaque if calcium does not? Of course it does. That's exactly what CIMT does. Um, and I don't know, you know what? Let, there's so much discussion about that right now. Let me see if I can find... Uh, Here's a couple of things about CIMT. As we talked about, that's where, where plaque is getting started. It's LDL. These little green things are, um, are actual MPO, myeloperoxidase enzymes that are being released by our immune system. And as you see, they make that, uh, that soft plaque can go back out into the bloodstream. The cytokines, some of those enzymes, inflammagens, things that make the inflammation, when they touch flowing blood can form a clot. And yes, so this is all um, hard plaque. It's got a waxy, a waxy sub, it's like a waxy substance, a waxy consistency. But as you see, again, I'm sorry, I forgot who, I think it was James asking about CIMT. CIMT will show this. It will show this stable plaque, it will show calcified plaque by actually showing the, you the calcifications and it will show soft plaque. It will give you, I mean, and that's one of the huge advantages to CIMT. It will give you statistics and numbers uh, regarding the exact um, amounts. And let me go down here. I should be able to show you. Um, a couple of things that might help in this area. Well, maybe, okay, here we go. So this comes from one of our, one of our videos. This is where I was interviewing Todd and we get some, a little bit better images a little bit later. Uh, this was a family practice physician. Um, 
as you see here, you get patient's arterial age. So again, you're not just looking to see this, this uh, physician, for example, clearly had more than 50% uh, blood flow. He didn't have, he had a couple of significant, what we call discrete plaques. This one was in the right bulb at 1.7. Uh, this was in the internal carotid. Again, anytime you get over 1.3 uh, we, millimeters, we call, uh, we call that a, a, a discrete plaque. But as you see, we measured, we go here. This is, the, um, this is where we're looking on the CIMT. Uh, and this is why I said it's, CIMT has some challenges in terms of being, making sure you have to have very, very rigid and robust uh, uh, quality systems to make sure that you're looking at the same place year after year and between different uh, IMT texts. So this is the carotid artery, the common, the external, the um, internal carotid. This is the bulb or the bifurcation. And usually if we're going to see discrete plaques, they quite often we're, we're more likely to see them here or start here than anywhere else. This little line, and I don't, don't know how much of that you can see, but that little faint line is the intima itself. That thick white line is the media, and the dark place in between is the plaque. It is um, the, oxid the LDL, oxidized LDL, that has gone through the intima and lodged in between the intima and the media. That is then measured. And in this individual, i uh, trying to, in this individual, it was 0 0.71 millimeters. Well, now here, let me go back. Here's how you get arterial age from this. There's a thing called a nomogram. It's where, you know, with, C, with CTA, with um, coronary order, I mean, yeah, with a calcium score, those are, ionizing radiation, their x-ray radiation. So you're not gonna be doing those on four-year-olds and 10-year-olds and 15-year-olds, but ultrasound is not ionizing radiation. It's not x-ray, it's ultrasound. It has no impact on the tissue. Uh, it doesn't cause cancer, it doesn't have any of that risk that you see with x-rays. So they've got these on uh, nomograms, they've got them on tens of thousands of people starting at birth. And guess what? Um, kids coming at, being born to mothers that had significant uh, maternal diabetes come out with significant increases in their intima media thickness. But so once you began to realize that, and you realize what I said a few minutes ago, but the, the difference between men and women and their calcium, I mean, their uh, intima media thickness and guess what? Men have heart attacks and strokes earlier than women. Here's why. Guess which line is the men's and which line is the women's? And if you can't think through the science, obviously the color should be a tip off. Anyhow, you go back to our friend, the, the family practitioner physician. His was 0 0.71 millimeters. You go up here, you go to 0 0.71, and then you go over here. Well, <clears throat> uh, he is, he was what? 56, but you, uh, a typical 56 year old should have what? Much less and his, uh, I'm sorry, he was, he was uh, 50 and a typical 50 year old should have a much lower 71 millimeters. So you go back and you find where does this uh, intersect with the blue line. And that intersects with the blue line at 56. So that's how you get an arterial age of 56 for that gentleman. In other words, he's putting down plaque faster than your typical person. The other thing I would show you is that uh, you can, you may be able to see here in this area, this will tell you how much of that plaque is soft, how much of that plaque is hard. And you see that with uh, with this one as well. Um, this is where my uh, CIMTs uh, at age 57 had a plaque uh, 
plug that position rate of, uh, uh, of the equivalent, giving me the arterial age of a 73 year old. Now, over the next, I started taking statins. Uh, I started dealing more with uh, carbs in my diet. And um, I lost about eight pounds. And sure enough, over the next, uh, what, 16, 18 months, my um, my IMT, intima media thickness, dropped dramatically down to less than a male. So my uh, IMT thickness right now is still that of a um, somebody in his early 50s rather than my biological age, which is in my early 60s. So you can do this. Again, it's not that common to see reversals, especially like I had, but it does happen. Again, this is a better, a better view of intima media thickness. Uh, that's what that uh, IMT is. That's what that means. This thin hair-like line is my intima. This thick white line is my media. And you see it's a little bit ragged. That's, it's always that way. Some places are thinner. Some places are thicker. But the different, and they've highlighted that line, those two lines, to show you exactly where they're taking the measurement. They take, the, they take about 600 cuts here. Uh, obviously not actual physical cuts, but cuts in the imaging. That's what, why it's called an IMT, and that's why it requires some, some special software to get it done. They will take that and then create the average. And again, um, when I was 60, my, uh, my uh, intimate thickness test had dropped from in the 70s down to 0.68. Down here, this shows a little bit more about the soft, heterogeneous, and echogenic. Echogenic means a, a completely stable, calcified plaque, soft, means what it says, and heterogeneous means that it's in between. And I've actually never been able to get my plaque completely calcified. I've remained heterogeneous, um, but I have decreased my uh, plaque size, as you saw, dramatically. So I hope this helps give you a little bit more depth and understanding on the questions that you're asking. And, Let's go back and see. Okay, ML, can you talk to us about CT angiogram, just to review all three tests while we have talked about IMT and CAC. So there's a couple of tests, uh, I mean, a couple of articles. The, the, the definitive, the more definitive one was um, Scott Hart. S-C-O-T dash H-E-A-R-T. You look it up and actually you can look at, I've got videos on that one and it's on its predecessor. I'm blanking on the predecessor. I don't think it was the Courage trial, although it may have been. So on the Scott Hart trial, trial here's what they did. By the way, the CT angiogram, you can look it up. You can Google it real quick. I'm not going to try to do that while I'm running a YouTube live, but what it does is it shows you a great, almost 3D looking image of the arteries in your heart, including the plaque in those arteries using CT um, technology. So it's a CT angiogram, angio meaning vessel, gram meaning uh, picture. And here's what they saw with, uh, with those two trials that I was talking about. One of them, the more definitive one being the Scott Heart trial. Here's what they did. Again, they're they're looking at docs in. They're not looking at me. They're looking at most of the re rest of the world in terms of docs. And what do they do? Uh, some combination of stress tests usually. So they stress test and or uh, stent um, angiogram with a invasive angiogram. You know where they they stick the needle in the groin and go up and shoot dye in there. And they said, here, go ahead and do what you normally do, Doc, in terms of stress tests and angiograms and whatever. But also um, do this, get a CT angiogram. And uh, when they compared CT angiogram plus stress test to stress test alone, here's what happened. 
they saw a lot more pathology, a lot more plaque than people knew on the stress test. And you know what? That just makes sense. It goes back to um, the Tim Russert story. It goes back to the all too common story of, oh, you know what? We were worried, so we got a stress test and it was negative. And he had a heart attack two weeks later. Um, it also goes back to what we already know about uh, about stress tests in that they're going to be negative unless you've got over 50% flow occlusion. And two thirds of heart attacks happen in people with less than 50% flow occlusion. So again, these things were consistent. So people that had the stress test plus the angi uh, CT angiogram did better long term. Um, and guess what? The bottom line is, as you get deeper into that study, it would, it would indicate, here's why. They felt like, you know what? I don't have a, a pass on this. I do have problems. And you know what? That one of our patients has shared with us, he wanted to put a picture of his CT angiogram up on his refrigerator because it's lifestyle that reverses our risk for heart attack and stroke not a stent, some, some of these other things that are so common. And if you get a negative stress test, you think, good, I've got a pass, I'm okay, I'm healthy, I'm not gonna have a heart attack. You continue your lifestyle and you have a heart attack. So I hope that helps ML. If you have another specific question regarding CT angiogram, let me know. Uh, CT angiogram, by the way, is like calcium score, it uses ionizing radi uh, um, radiation. I personally am not concerned about the amount of ionizing radiation you may get from a calcium score or even a CT angiogram in most cases, because we're talking about, uh, you know, we're talking about adding the potential of a cancer uh, for, you know, every 60 years and uh, maybe a cancer death. And, and that sounds bad, but with people with this kind of plaque, we're talking about a 20 to 40 percent heart attack probability in the next 10 years. So the concerns about radiation are not really a big deal. Uh, what we want to do, though, is we want to find out how much plaque we have, whether it's soft or not, and how much danger we have. Because just a little bit of plaque can squeeze out into that artery and form a clot. Uh, Dave Murphy, kind of annoyed. My local heart hospital used to do CIMT. Now that you've convinced me to do one, they're no longer doing them. And with no reason why they stopped. Have to travel 200 plus miles now to get one. Well, there is there may be a, a good side of that story, Dave. Um, as you saw from my pictures, um, you have to be very careful on how you do them and local hospitals often aren't. So what you often get from a local hospital can be very deceptive. I'd be very careful about depending on a local hospital. Karsten Nielsen is hard or a combo of hard and soft calcium that sucks up the fat and hardens kind of like cement. Well, as I showed you, um, it's a continuum. The more calcium you have, the higher the concentration of calcium in there, the more organized and scarred down uh, and stable that plaque is. David Murphy, what's a good MPO? Uh, it depends on which MPO uh, test kit you're using, usually less than 400. Jim D, are there typical ratio relationships between uh, uh, calcium score Vis visible calcium and the soft plaque. No, they're not. It, it, they're not. Uh, that's a great idea. It's a great thought. But here's the thing. Are you, is your process mostly inflammatory? Are you walking around with blood sugars in the 180s, 190s, 210s, and or cal uh, um, insulin levels over 100 for six hours a day? Or are you constantly keeping your blood sugar below 100 and, and your uh, insulin levels below 20 or even below 5? 
If the former, then you're going to have a huge uh, ratio of soft plaque to hard plaque. If the latter, it's going to be the opposite. So it really depends on what's going on with you. And again, those two things really didn't get into some of the other variables like uh, how much body fat you have, whether or not you have an inflammatory process like an inflammatory, classic inflammatory disease, like inflammatory bowel disease or rheumatoid arthritis. Carlson Nielsen is harder. Okay. Uh, I think we've got. Uh, Lori's uh, making folks aware that she's available. She's the nurse educator here with our heart center. And she'd love to hear about your health goals and concerns. Here's her number, 859-757-2324. That's uh, 859-757-2324. And Laurie's doing some good work in terms of helping us get to where we need to be in terms of helping folks. The hard part, I mean, it, it's hard enough to understand the science behind this. But the real hard part is incorporating that into your daily life to get your body where it needs to be. And Janice and Lori do a lot of work helping people get, get exactly there. My BJJ, a $5 super chat sticker. Thank you so much, my BJJ. As you've seen, we've got a team in, in terms of getting this message out. Um, I've retired a few times now and uh, have am continuing to consult right now, uh, helping people get back to work with uh, COVID-19. But um, rather than play golf, we're uh, PrevMed, myself, our team is out there helping people uh, try to understand what you can do to keep yourself from dying unnecessarily early or ending up in a wheelchair for two decades before you do. So that every little bit helps my BJJ. Thank you so much. I believe that Ivor Cummins recommends living a lifestyle that reduces oxidized LDL as a primary method to neutralize the risk for high LP little a. What are your thoughts on this? Absolutely, LP little a. And I, I get a lot of people that uh, there's a significant crossover between my channel and Ivor Cummins. I, uh, I left Ivor a couple of comments a couple of times to see if he wanted to do a a uh, joint chant, uh, joint visit or two. He said yes, but he's never gotten back around to me. I'd love to, uh, if any of you know him or uh, if you want to send him more requests, I'd be very happy. I'd love to do one with him. I think what will happen is that uh, our folks, our viewers that don't know about Ivor and Ivor's viewers that don't know about us uh, would both profit from that activity. Uh, Ivor and I have a totally different approach. He's much more engineering, much more focused on um, low carb, low carb, low carb. And I'm a physician. I'm much more focused on patient care. And I get uh, way deep into a lot of technical stuff that uh, Ivor hasn't touched. Uh, so again, very different channels, but a lot of overlap. Now, LP little a is a form. It's a genetic variation of LDL. That's all LP little a is. And most physicians haven't even heard of LP little a. Uh, the bottom line is it's been documented many times to be a significant cause of heart attack and stroke. And if you don't believe that, look up the name Bob Harper. If that doesn't sound, um, if you don't know already, he was the one of the exercise gurus on The Biggest Loser. In the early, in his, uh, I think, early 50s, as a, a TV star and celebrity for staying healthy and keeping at a good uh, weight level, he had a heart attack. So obviously that caught everybody's attention. Then a week or two after his heart attack, he came out and said it was LP little a. So docs were saying, you know what, LP little a is just, I mean, it's a dirty little secret. We, we don't think we can fix it and yada, yada, yada. And here's several things. Uh, my BJJ, I, don't, I haven't heard uh, Ivor's full uh, activity. I would agree with him on decreasing inflammation. I would not agree 
if he's saying, like most docs, that niacin does not help for LP little a. First of all, I do recommend a trial of niacin because I've seen multiple patients with significant decreases. Now, here's a couple of the problems, and uh, I could go on. I've actually got three or four significant videos on niacin, niacin and LP little a. Um, if, if you actually what most people think, well, we only got a like a 25 or 30 percent decrease in LP little a, so it the niacin didn't help. That's wrong. If you watch inflamm inflammatory panels, if you watch other bioindicators, usually if you can get a 30% decrease in LP little a, you do see a significant decrease in the inflammation panel and the other indicators of inflammation. So um, this statement that niacin doesn't work for LP little a is wrong. Now, um, those of you who have significant LP little a, and I'm assuming maybe BJJ that you do, as you know, there's a lot of good information coming out now from the anti-sense drugs. They're not ready for prime time either yet. They're, you know, they're still in trial. And when they do come out, they're gonna be tens of thousands per year. I've had very few patients that were not able to get better control of their LP little a. In fact, I haven't had any patient that wasn't able to get better control. I've had uh, very few patients who weren't able to get uh, comfortable control where they felt like, you know what, I'm fine, I know what to do. Dave Murphy, thanks for another informative session. Thank you, uh, Dave, for your interest. Jim D, yes, Ivor Cummins rocks. Should definitely collaborate with him in an interview together. Well, help me get that done. I don't know what else to say to Ivor. And if I, and if I sound like I'm leaving him a present, uh, hopefully so. Hopefully some people will get in touch and say, why don't you talk with Doc? Dave Murphy, have you seen a Biggest Loser reunion? No. Most of them are all fat again. Yep. No question. Thank you so much for your interest today. And uh, we will see you on Wednesday. Carl?